And as we strike 10 o'clock, we are live, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 17th, I can't believe it, of Randstad's Expert Echo webinar series, where we shall, in a moment, be having a futuristic discussion with David Rowan, the former decade-long editor of Wired magazine, of course, um, as editor of the Technology and Trends magazine, a Sunday Times technology columnist, David will be able to provide a unique insight into AI and digital disruption more broadly and its impact on our lives, our working lives especially. He can also claim to have chaired the G8 Innovation Summit, among many other accolades, and has written a business bestseller entitled Non-Bullshit Innovation, my kind of title that, 17 Proven Ways to Transform How You Work which has been published in Japan, Korea, Russia, Ukraine, and beyond. Great stuff. Now, you will be able to uh, ask your own questions using the Q&A functionality at the bottom of your screens and upvote those which you think are best. And I'll do my best to keep across those and answer those questions in about 20 minutes time. Keep them short, please. I will ignore the long ones and any sort of long-winded commentary. I can't read that quickly. Uh, the session is being recorded and a link will be sent to all of you but access is limited to those who have registered for the event and the link will expire in about a month's time. Now, before I interview Tim, Tim, I don't mean Tim, I mean David, uh, who I can confirm is actually here. We've not created a virtual hologram of him. Before that, we've got some Randstad poll results hot off the press to share with you all to provide a little context for some of today's themes. So first slide up, please, guys. OK, so this month, this very month, we polled 1147 people asking them how worried they were about their job being replaced by AI. Turns out they are quite worried. 26 percent very worried, in fact, and another 20 percent slightly concerned. 37 percent are not at all worried, but this audience is taken from the Randstad UK website. So perhaps disproportionately likely to be in roles like teaching, social care, nursing and construction which are arguably, and it is arguable, which are arguably less likely to be impacted by such innovation. Uh, but obviously there are exceptions in those, even in those sectors. Next slide, please, guys. And 40% of us um, are already using AI tools for work-related tasks. I suspect many of the others just don't know that they are. But anyway, 37% said, said they don't and don't want to. And the balance, 23% saying not yet, but are considering it. Uh, next slide, please. And this one is as hot off the press as it gets. We closed it late last night. 60% of our poll of 680 people, so statist statistically very robust, guys, error ratio of about 1% to 2% on that one, would support a decision to ban AI tools in the workplace. So a, a Luddite rebellion brewing in the background, for sure, it would seem. OK, next slide, please, guys. Some predictions for you here which you can take with salt if you wish. Um, the World Economic Forum claimed that AI will replace 85 million jobs by 2025, but they also predict that AI will generate at least 97 million jobs within the next 500 days in the same time frame. So if they both come true, there'll be a, a net positive of jobs in the workplace globally, according to them. At the bottom there, you see Goldman Sachs, claiming that AI will replace slash disrupt up to 300 million jobs in the same time frame. So one of them has got it wrong, met very wrong, or uh, one of them has got it right, very right, we shall, we shall see. Next slide, please. More crystal ball gazing, this time from McKinsey, who predicts that AI's impact on productivity could add trillions to the value of the global economy, anywhere between 2.6 and 4.4 trillion dollars to be precise or rather not that precise that's quite a range there but a positive range uh, no doubt uh next slide please guys closer to home now uh there are over fifty thousand people employed in the uk's ai industry which contributed 3.7 billion pounds to our economy last year and we are apparently home to twice as many ai products and services as any other european country currently so good news for the UK. Uh, next slide, please. And the one that we always share with you all. Some ONS stats for the UK for you now, uh, with payroll employees hitting an all-time high again at, at a flat 30 million people. 
a rise of 1.8 million since last year. The unemployment rate is at 3.8%, um, just 3.8%, not wanting to downgrade the pain of those that are in that situation, but it is a, an historically low rate still. And a reminder that there are over 1 million vacancies in the UK right now. And finally, a heads up, next slide please, that our Randstad employer brand research from which much of our insight derives is available to download in its entirety now. It launched two or three weeks ago. It is the biggest workplace study in the world with 163,000 responses and gives you all manner of insight into what employees really, really want and what the best companies are doing to attract that talent. So please take a look. I promise it will make you better informed, if not cleverer. Right, anyhow, back to today, please, guys, and back to the talent in the hot seat this time, David Rowan, not Tim. God knows where that one came from. Um, welcome, welcome, David. I almost said it again. Welcome, Tim. <laughs> welcome, David. The floor is yours for the next 10, 12, 15 minutes or so, and then we'll, we'll jump to the Q&A. Go for it. Thanks, Adam. Um, I just think it's amazing that so many people um, are on the call. It's either that they think Randstad is going to help them get their next career opportunities, or they're terrified that we're all going to be the victims of autonomous weapon systems, or the AI is going to turn us into paperclips. Um, so I just want to set the scene a bit, because um, I'm spending a lot of time with the startups, visiting the research labs with the AI engineers. And I am the victim of disruption. So I wrote a book. I went to lots of countries to try and find proper examples in, of innovation. And I got a good publisher, Penguin. And then they sent me into an airless studio in West London to spend three days recording the audio book. And, you know, it was intense. You get a sore throat, lots of herbal tea. And then I realized an AI startup could have done it in 10 minutes. Imagine turning your book into an audiobook in just 10 minutes. Now you can using audiobook.ai for 10 times less than paying a voice talent. All you have to do is upload your book to audiobook.ai, select a voice from over 30 natural sounding voices, and in 10 minutes you can download your audiobook. And guess what? She's a synthetic voice. She's not real. So I think my starting point is tech is now moving so fast, especially AI, it can feel out of control. This morning, this video going viral, showing a self-driving car being pulled over by police in San Francisco. This is crazy. The car was pulled over because it was driving at night without headlights on. At first, it looks like an ordinary traffic stop. An officer gets out of his car to speak to the driver, only to discover- Ain't nobody in it. And then the car speeds away from the officers, passing through an intersection. Because the AI knows it's safer the other side of the red light. Now, I don't know if you caught the Google Developers Conference last month. Um, this is Sundar, the head of Google. There was a kind of subtle theme he was trying to address. Um, the Verge put together his very long talk into 14 seconds. See if you can work out what he was trying to say. AI, 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 generative AI, generative AI, generative AI, 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 did you, did you did you spot the message there? So they're they're trying to. I didn't, David. I'll be honest. For it wouldn't get to number trending. one. But even now, you look at Google Maps, and suddenly you get to look inside a restaurant that you're about to click on. And this is not a drone taking a video. This is a couple of static pictures that they've used a neural network to stitch together. So already, the way we discover, the way we choose where to spend money is being affected by this. Goldman Sachs says up to 300 million full-time jobs around the world could be affected by artificial intelligence. In a report Sunday, their economists predicted 18% of work globally could be computerized. As you said, but guess what? Goldman Sachs is also using generative AI to get rid of a whole bunch of writing code jobs. So, you know, there's pluses and minuses. I think all we know for certainty is the type of work that is going to be in demand is going to change. Anything involving something formulaic, something involving data entry, something routine is not in such a good place. But anything involving critical thinking, analytical ways of looking at things, emotional and care 
based aspects of our personas, flexibility are going to do better. But, you know, in any industry, in finance, we're already having AI. Bloomberg's developing its own large language model. There's a huge amount of investment here. I kind of worry that it's going to be a small number of companies that control the oligopoly of access. I think we don't want greater income disparity because parts of the economy can't access these tools. But at the moment, something extraordinary is happening, which is the AI is becoming accessible to everybody with tools like Midjourney that allow you to type a text prompt and you can get stuff that doesn't exist. This is a version of Lord of the Rings made by Wes Anderson, who never made Lord of the Rings. But because the AI is now so good at creating simulations based on what's already in the memory, in the database, you can create magic. And it is a time of magic. And it started relatively recently. So before OpenAI made ChatGPT, it made Dali, which allowed you to type a text prompt and it would change an image. And at the time it was extraordinary and exciting, but that was like light years ago. That was like, you know, a couple of years ago because it's moving so quickly. It's that Moore's law, the exponential growth. At the moment, it's not just open AI, there's startups like Runway, you type in a text prompt, you get a video. And you can alter the video on the go. If you've been playing the latest version of Photoshop, Adobe, again, lets you import generative designs and images. And what's been happening with text and images has been happening with sound. But this is the one that everybody's excited about, slightly terrified about. You don't need to understand the technicality, but essentially it's a large language model, lots of data in the database, and it predicts what comes next. And it sounds hugely persuasive, although it can sound too confident when it's not entirely accurate. That's known as hallucinating. But it's already hitting share prices, the ability to do a degree, the ability to write a poem, and it's being democratized. This video is generated by AI. The AI avatar is generated by Midjourney. Script is generated by ChatGPT. Text to audio is done by Eleven Labs. And finally, image to video conversion is done by DID AI. And we're at the moment now where I think, just as this man, Mr. Gutenberg, democratize access to stories, to the written word. And in the 90s, this man helped democratize access to a digital way of sharing stories. I think we're at that very beginning. When I, when I first tried the Netscape browser in 1994, it was terrible. Tiny, slow call-up speeds, very little information on the internet. But you could sense even then that it was going to change how we learn what's happening in the world, how we buy things, how we get entertained. But you have to see yourself on that exponential curve that hasn't quite arrived. At some stage, we couldn't see it, obviously then, video will arrive. At some stage, it'll be safe to start spending money at scale. But it wasn't at the beginning. And I think we're just at the beginning, that Netscape moment with AI. Make me an app that lets me record my workouts. Yeah. So we're already at the stage where startups like Replit let you build an app just by talking to it. And so if you're a software coder or you have a web design agency, you know, you've got to take notice. But Replit and Midjourney and ChatGPT are just some of the tools out there. And, you know, there are tools now that generate and edit video and code and art, and they can write your marketing copy. And increasingly, it's hugely persuasive. And of course, there are consequences. You know, how can you tell what's real and what's not real? The sci-fi magazine stopped taking stories because everybody was using the AI to write their stories. What about education? You are the best psychology professor in the world. You write this essay plan. That is actually ridiculous. 
ChatGPT, the AI that has taken the world by storm over the past couple of months. But can you use it to do a PhD at Oxford University? If you're new to my channel, my name's Francis. I'm studying for a doctorate in clinical psychology at Oxford University. Or actually I was until ChatGPT came out. Since then I've been leveling up my guns in Call of Duty and doing some traveling, trying to improve my cooking, etc. Although if you do your homework using ChatGPT, remember to delete the first line. You know, when you copy and paste it, I'm sorry, it's an air <laughs> language model, I can't, I can't answer that. But I'm interested in what it means for our human skills. And, you know, we've got strikes in Hollywood because screenwriters don't want to write, don't want the AI to write their jokes, but try stopping it. You know, Italy tried to ban it. Companies are losing half their value because they're not keeping up with it. And I think the real risk is what happens when the bad guys start using this at scale, when you can personalize um, phishing attacks, when foreign states that are hostile can personalize messaging based on your prejudices that they can increasingly process and send you very persuasive suggestions that help influence your voting. Um, now the AI, I'm an optimist, is gonna help us design better drugs, but of course, you know, there's always a downside. But what does it mean for jobs? I can't promise everybody is going to make $375,000 by writing text prompts, but there are a whole bunch of new tasks and we can talk about, you know, which kind of job skills are relevant soon. Um, but everywhere you look, it's going to change things. You know, if you are running a foreign call center, you can in real time change the accents of the call center workers. This one did not stop. It kept going. It this is a New York Times tech correspondent who found a slightly worrying aspect of the AI. It told, it, it told him, this is Kevin Roos, that it was in love with him and he should leave his wife. This one did not stop. It kept going. It kept telling me that it was in love with me and trying to get me to say that I loved it back. No matter what I tried to change the subject to, it would keep coming back to these kind of creepy stalkerish messages. It also told you, you said, no, I'm in love with my wife. They were like, no, you're not. And you said, yes, I am. I just celebrated a Valentine's dinner, a lovely Valentine's dinner with my, my wife. And it said, no, you had a boring Valentine's dinner. I mean, this is a monster. Well, it's not a monster, but it is a model, uh, um, an AI model that is, is behaving in ways that frankly concern me. And we also need to get concerned because if we don't have that conversation now about what we're actually opening the door to, bad stuff could happen. So you probably saw that Jeffrey Hinton, a senior AI person, a guru, left Google Alphabet recently. And he gave interviews when he was talking about his worries. He worries that we won't be able to tell true and not true. He's worried about what happens when the AI learns more about us than we know about us. He worries about what happens eventually when the AI controls autonomous weapon systems, that we allow it to set off. But my view is at the first moment, let's not worry too much, let's debate, but let's also have a bit of a sense of human humor about it. I love it when people are starting to use the AI to try and do fun stuff. So um, a couple of people started training ChatGPT to write things in the style of an inter-office memo. Um, this is the opening of the Old Testament, the beginning of Genesis. What if you could write the beginning of the Bible in an office memo style? On day one, we initiated the light and darkness differentiation process. We branded the light as day and the darkness at night. That was a major milestone for our, et cetera. And then somebody thought, no, we're gonna go one better. Let's get Genesis as an Ikea manual. So it's super creative. Let's not lose our sense of humor and perspective. And let's not worry too much about all the jobs falling away because of the AI. Because in the past, when there has been a technology trigger, you know, the growth of the spreadsheet, yes, the purple line, the bookkeeping, the accounting, the auditing clerk jobs have fallen. But look how many new jobs are created. The more senior cognitive functions are still needed. So, as Adam said, I come from kind of the context of Wired, which is trying to understand the future from the people building it, not just tech and science, but design, architect, creative thinking people. And 
I do think we need that conversation now because it's moving so quickly. You constantly see when you're running a publication like Wired, exponential curves, the Moore's law idea. And this picture I always think about, this is 1956, this is five megs of computer storage being uploaded to the cloud, which is now one picture on your iPhone. And if you think about what's happened with computer processing and computer storage, that kind of halving in price till it comes to zero, it's happening in every other sector. This is a logarithmic scale of this falling cost of sequencing DNA, the falling cost of solar panels on a logarithmic scale, the falling cost of batteries. So every industry is now being hit by various types of exponential curve. And the thing about an exponential curve is you can ignore it for a bit, but then there's that inflection point and you can't. This is on the orange, the curve showing the total value of all US cryptocurrencies until the middle of 2021. And the blue is the total value of US dollars. In 2016, 2017, you could ignore that, but in 2020, it becomes really dangerous to think it's gonna be business as usual. And you know, this is a new exponential curve I'm a bit obsessed by. This is the total number of space launches because Elon has helped make rockets reusable, the price has come down. This is gonna change the number of satellites giving us communication, the number of experiments happening in space, but we are on a massive exponential curve, not just with AI, but with quantum computing, with some of these new technologies trying to take carbon out of the planet. Watch those curves, because you can ignore them for a bit, but soon they take over. So I wanna leave you with a bit of philosophy, philosophy, Phil, philosophical ethical thinking because we're the people we're the ones who have to decide what we want what constraints we want to build in these by the way are not people these are all generated by an ai the downside is if you don't know how the algorithms are programmed bad stuff can happen because of the bias inherent in the people who code if you don't have accountability to the code then who are we? If you just let a few private companies control it, that's not good for us. If you can't open that black box and see transparently what the data sources are, that's not going to be helpful. What happens to the data, not just that it uses as its source material, but that it gathers even unwittingly based on our behavior in real time? What happens to us as people if our second brain becomes the generative AI. If you've already been playing with ChatGPT, you'll know it's quite tempting to get it to write those difficult memos or even novels, because it can. What happens to our ability to think long-term? What happens to our idea of what knowledge is if the AI is increasingly an extension of us? And what happens to stop the bad guys using this at scale? I worry about this, if there's just a couple of very big multinational companies controlling access. Are they going to act in public interest or shareholder interest? And what happens when at scale we're persuaded to believe in things, to follow behavior that maybe are not in our interests? So this is, I think, what we need to think about. What do we want in terms of the framework? Because at some stage soon, the doubling and doubling effect is going to make the AI, the AI so powerful that if you program into it something like save the planet from carbon and you give it enough autonomy, it may decide, okay, we can use carbon capture, we can create new materials, but the real problem is those humans that are putting more carbon in there. So maybe we need to constrain those humans. I'm going to finally give you a sense of us as flawed humans, which is kind of the problem. We have biases ourselves. We are scared of emerging technologies. We're in denial about them, but you know they come. So this guy, Bill Rimmer, puts his mum in his Tesla, sets it to autonomous mode, and films her response. Oh, there's cars coming! Oh, oh there's cars! Oh, Bill, just put me back for me to control it! And this oh, is a bit like all Jesus. of us. You know, we oh, are scared. Of these ah, transformations. Oh, where's it going? But you know, in a couple of weeks, it's just going to be another way for her oh my God. to go and well, visit her so friends. And play cards. Oh, Jesus, this is my first. Anyway, um, my dog didn't like it. He's scared. <laughs> Good stuff. Thank you, David. That was 
beyond insightful. A bit, um, a bit too much talking for a Thursday early morning, I guess. But I think if we don't have these conversations now, other people are going to make the decisions. And regulators in general tend to come in too late and too heavily. The European regulators are doing their best, I think, to try and create accountability. But we all need to be part of the conversation. Yeah, quite. Com I couldn't agree more. We'll come on to that ethical and philosophical standpoint in a second. Let let's get to the, the nub of the question on the on the webinar title uh, around uh, around jobs, really, you know, we've learned that the World Economic Forum claim that AI will will bring us 97 million jobs, but Goldman Sachs also claiming that potentially 300 million are impacted. Yeah. What do you think the truth is, please? Um, are people's concerns justifiable, or are we getting caught up in the media hype here? No, it's not hype. There is a massive transition happening, and it's happening on an accelerated timescale. So if you begin a degree course at university now, you're probably going to do a job three years later that hasn't been invented or is, is not well known at the moment. So the truth is, what does the AI currently and in the near future do very well? It processes large amounts of data and it articulates it in a form factor that allows us to use it. Where is that useful? Well, anything involving data entry and processing, anything involving automation, anything involving visual signals that a machine vision algorithm could analyze. If you are a radiographer looking at people's scans from the MRI, the AI is going to be your friend. It's going to process them more accurately at scale. You'll still need, I think, the expert to work out what to do and to communicate with the patient. But you know, if you're a financial analyst, if you're a sales rep, if you're a construction laborer, if you're a secretary, you know, the combination of in increased access to robotics and tools that allow all of us to use the automation AI tools, that's going to mean that your job skill, you know, and I'm a journalist, you know, I'm increasingly not that relevant to the economy but i have to find my high level skills that can't easily compete with the ai so maybe i organize events or maybe i show opinions on the news as it happens now where i think we can be optimistic is the human is still needed to tell us what to do we have trust we have that emotional connection we have that power of contextualizing so if you are a specialist in digital strategy, if you are a specialist in process automation, if you concentrate on information security and cybersecurity, all these are going to be increasingly sought. If you focus on you know, organizational development, anything also that involves the inherent human nature of our relationship. So I think we're going to need more human agents for stuff that is difficult. The, the therapist, the, um, the person who can guide you through the infinite number of choices that the medical AI has given you. Um, you know, the educator is still gonna be there. They have empathy, but they may yeah. work alongside the AI tools that customize the education based on where you are today, not on the average of the whole class. Do you see a a mismatch. It seems to me that with AI's ability to replace tedious, repetitive tasks, largely done, not exclusively done, but largely done by unskilled labour in in across countries. But the the opportunities, the new roles, are going to be those that are relatively high tech, um, you know, uh, roles. And there's a mismatch there between the unskilled talent that's going to become available but the opportunities available will be those that are high tech. So, you know, society needs to kind of upskill those individuals, but they're not always going to be the kind of people that could be or want to be upskilled. How do you think that's going to play out? I'm not looking back to a golden age of factory work, of typing pools, 
of heavy agricultural work. You know, a century ago, half of the American workforce was in agriculture. Now it's one or two percent. I don't think anybody wants to go back there. I think it's an opportunity to question the meaning we want from our work and also to discover how to rise higher up that Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Because if more of us have the aspiration and the ability to head towards self-actualization, towards something that's much more fulfilling, then I think collectively we win. The trouble is, as some of us get the opportunity to work on more higher cognition tasks and not to work a fixed number of hours in a day in a production line type job to have that flexibility, there are going to be still quite a lot at the bottom of the pyramid who are still struggling to satisfy essential needs, you know, security, shelter. And in the short term, we're already seeing even middle-class jobs becoming less in demand because of the automation. And if you're facing higher mortgages and higher costs and inflation, um, who's there to protect you? So I think we need a, a really honest debate about how we get people through that transition until they are retrained with the new skills. Do we need a universal basic income? If income disparity grows, then it creates you know, dangerous polarization. And you've seen in the last couple of decades, it's not great. If you go to you know, the tech hub of San Francisco, it's dysfunctional as a city. The have-nots need to be brought in to this future. Yeah, the, 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 um, there's a bank, wasn't there, that uh, where a whole team of PhD-level financial analysts are now at risk after an AI model outperformed them. So it certainly isn't um, just administrative, repetitive task roles that are going to get disrupted. It is upper middle class roles. Was it 46% of lawyers will be uh, replaced by AI by 2030, I think I read, and marketing well, roles I, is 42%. I, I, would frame it, I would frame it differently. I would say, you know, maybe 46% maybe of the tasks lawyers currently do will be replaced by AI. But so tasks, not jobs. Yeah. Well, as long as they are flexible enough and trained enough to redefine their role. So perhaps it becomes more advisory, more about aggregating all the options that the smart machine gives for this particular case. Now, there's no point having lawyers at vast amounts per hour just reading documents trying to spot patterns the ai will do that but you do want the lawyer helping you understand because of your particular context and your particular financial family economic other needs what's right for you so i think you know the skills that we teach are going to change and i hope it will create greater job satisfaction in the long term. Because if you can actually empathize and help people solve genuine problems using a whole new toolkit, then don't we all win? Quite, I mean, talking of, of education, there was a, an interesting piece in the FT, um, which looked at the impact of AI on education. It posed the question, should educators ban AI writing tools completely to prevent students um, using it to think for them? Um, or should they move in the opposite direction and you know, experiment with ways to use generative AI to enhance their lessons? What are your thoughts yeah. on that? Because it does seem to me that, you know, it's a bit like um, they, they talk about the overstimulation of children these days because they don't ever get opportunity to get bored. And so, brain chemistry is changing because kids are not having bits of their summer holiday where they're bored anymore when they're trying to think how to do something with their mate to have fun um, because they've got tools and tablets that can give them access to the planet's kind of game games. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think? Adam, if you look back at how media conversation was shaped around the advent of radio and comic books, and early black and white television, 
it was always a threat to our children. It was going to dehumanize them. And children are okay. And, you know, I have a teenager who's on YouTube and TikTok quite a lot. And he's learned how to play the guitar. He's learned how to compose music in garage bands. So, you know, there's an upside. Um, I do think we need a fundamental re-examination of what education is for. Because the way we educate now is still a product of the industrial, the industrial revolution, creating a massive demand for systemic thinking for the production line workers. And the world isn't like that now. The world is about yeah. helping people discover their gifts, their self-expression, and also not just learning as an average in the class, but personally working out where they are and what skills they need. And the AI gives us those tools. You can, if you're learning a language, if you're learning maths, have real-time feedback loops that show what skills you still need to refine, but where you're doing okay. If you are a science teacher, you can take your students into the Large Hadron Collider in a metaverse context. You can give them access to the world's best teacher that you're working alongside. We need to be a bit more creative and imaginative, but also life skills are going to constantly need iterating as you know, quantum computing changes a whole bunch of industries. How do we ensure that all of us have an expectation that we're not fully formed after our tertiary education, but that's just the beginning and that's taught us this flexibility and adaptability and curious autodidactic self educating that we're gonna need for good. So I hate these critiques of people spending too long playing games. Games teach you all sorts of creative and cognitive and social skills. If you look at a lot of the way we work in the daytime, that was pioneered a couple of years earlier by gamers in the evenings and on weekends. The idea of um, virtual currencies, you know, that yeah. experiment happened in games like Second Life and Fortnite. Yeah. If you look at the way people express their identity in a digital way, that happened with the avatars that we choose for our game persona. If you look at what metaverses are, if you look at how people are already spending money to attend the virtual concert, you know, everything that Apple is hoping to achieve from its three and a half thousand dollar immersive ski goggles, you know, all, all the content has been played with in those virtual worlds. Yeah, I remember I was at a British Chamber of Commerce gig a couple of years ago, and um, I forget his name now, but the founder of Game and the founder of Dungeons and Dragons was in the audience talking to three or four hundred uh, head teachers, most of whom, of course, were parents. And he told them all off for shouting up the stairs to get their kids off their games consoles and come down and sort of, you know, have dinner or whatever. And he said, you know, you're you're stopping them exercising the the one muscle that's going to make them employable 10 years down the line because you're you're stuck in teaching them things that are are set in a 19th century kind of education educational infrastructure so but yeah it's, I, it's I human nature we are scared of something that you know has rewritten the rules we're scared that our own experiences are going to be less relevant um how can we develop our own curiosity, our own ability in a safe context, in a guided context to play with these new tools so that it's not scary, it's actually exciting. I mean, if I were many of the people on this call who are not working in crypto or climate tech or human rights, I would say, turn up one day at a crypto conference at a climate tech conference, at a human rights conference, and just see how people are solving their problems using technology tools, using their ways of building community. And you could probably learn things that you could take back to your day job. So I think we need to get better 
at looking outside our familiar context. Okay, thank you for that. Um, right, a couple more questions from me, then we'll go to the floor. Um, I recently read that London has been named the most high-tech city in the world, beating San Francisco uh, and New York, etc. So are, are there any other pockets of technical genius in the UK and Ireland, places that our clients on the call might want to set, set up a, a tech innovation team or for our talent that's on the call to migrate to? So one of the themes that I kept discovering when researching my book, and I went to 20 countries from you know, Peru to China, trying to find you know, the real cultures of transformation. And it wasn't just in companies, it was in countries. And you know, Estonia created a way for people who aren't physically in Estonia to create a digital identity, to create companies inside the Estonian system. Um, and the one thing I kept finding was real innovation happens when people who think differently come together and run into each other. And that's why, you know, all my tech friends go to Burning Man in August, a temporary city of 70,000 people in the Nevada desert where you can create a new identity for a week. It's a non-cash economy. It's an experimental creative expression economy. And one of the benefits that London has had for a while is we were really good at absorbing immigrants. We were really good at absorbing people from different places. And we have some very good technical education there. We have proximity to lots of other universities and capital and markets. Now let's not get into politics, but once you start restricting the ability of other people from other places in Europe to come and work there, you're causing yourself harm. Suddenly, I'm seeing a boom in places like Lisbon, which have gone out of their way to attract digital nomads, to attract people from outside creating tech businesses. I'm still optimistic about the UK as a place of tech clusters. We have some amazing advantages. You know, on deep science, we were there early in unraveling the you know double helix of dna and you know in terms of genomics research we're world class we have some amazing technical universities not just in the south but in the north we have um you know tax breaks that make it attractive for early stage angel investors to back companies that are probably going to fail because that's the nature of early stage investing um we just need to build a culture that allows really ambitious experimentation. We need the European version or the UK version of open AI to have a chance of getting funded. And we need to get rid of this small-minded approach. A lot of university spin-outs are held back by the tech transfer office wanting to own 20 or 30% of the shares because it's based on academic research and that kills a company from scratch, it stops yeah. them raising later funding. Yeah, so I would sense. say, if this government wanted to ensure London continues to be a dominant place for tech innovation, um, create conditions which make it easy for people to come and work here, maintain fiscal incentives, make sure that you know there is policy that helps the really ambitious companies build here and not feel they have to go to the States. And, you know, copy what's happening in smaller European tech clusters in you know, Stockholm and Tel Aviv and Berlin. One of the advantages sure. they have had in places like Berlin is because rents have been relatively low for a while. People come there for other from other places and it's the cognitive diversity, it's the people from different places coming together. I don't think rents are that low in London now. So again, everything feeds into each well, other. Quite, and yet demand for them isn't as strong as it was, but prices still seem to be very high. Um, talk to us about how AI could bring greater equitability. Um, equitability is, is huge for us at Randstad. It's kind of half of our strategy is to become the most equitable talent company in the world. So talk to us about that. Depends how you define equitable, but I think I worry that 
the AI, if not constrained, will amplify bias and inequality. And, you know, you can program it anonymously to vet a thousand job applications and to choose the best candidates, but who defines best? And, you know, if you are you know, a darker skin tone than you and me, is the algorithm going to make certain assumptions about that photo? If you are using a writing approach that doesn't show, you know, the traditional British Queen's You've English. got a bit quiet, David, if you could... Yeah. yeah, if... So we need to make sure we're working really hard on reducing the algorithmic bias. We need to make sure that access to the database, to the algorithm, to the tool is widespread, fair, and not dependent on you know, your current social status, the company you work for, your ability to pay. Um, and we need to, as I suggested in my little presentation, um, we need to define among ourselves, what is the goal? What is fairness? What is a sense of equality? Okay, thank you. A few questions from the floor now in our last 15 minutes. Um, the one that I can see with the most votes uh, is what do you, from Paul Templar. Thank you very much. What do you see happening with AI in education, especially with coursework? I think the inference there is that coursework kind of has to die, right? Uh, in the context of, of, of it being too easy to kind of game, game the system and, and get chat GPT to write the thing for you. Why should the feedback loop happen once a year? Why should you wait till May or June to be tested when you could be tested and your skills iterated and improved every minute? Why should you be constrained by the luck in getting a teacher who is inspiring when you can have access to the world's best coursework, yeah. just guided by the human? Why should the teacher spends so much time doing the dull administrative stuff. You know, there's a marking strike at the moment on for university um, examiners. You know, people are graduating this week not knowing what degree they have. The and they won't do for up to six months, 12 months. Yeah, the AI control. can do that. So those educators can focus on the stuff that really makes a difference, which is the human skills, which is the aggregation skills, which is the inspiring of the student. Um, and I, I think, you know, we need to rethink what we expect from an education, which is not simply, you know, learning facts and learning um, existing skill sets, but it's learning adaptive thinking. It's learning critical and analytical ways of thinking. And it's learning how to learn and to unlearn and to relearn. I was in somebody's um, library last week and they have a whole collection of those thick books that teach you how to use software. Do you remember from, you know, decades ago, the first time you use Excel, there's a massive book. Yeah, Excel for dummies. Mine wasn't so thick. That, but it's taking up space in a physical library that makes no sense. So education, I just think is not about information as much as strategic thinking mindset and showing you how to keep learning. How do you see AI, um, oh, that question's just disappeared, but if I can remember it, um, AI in construction, have you been exposed to any, um, any innovation there that's gonna improve how we build our buildings. Yeah, so I don't think we Al should- Douglas be, Winkworth, yes. I don't think we should talk about AI in isolation because there are a whole bunch of other trends that are pushing for behavior change. Um, and you know, one of them that I mentioned is the massive 
push towards net zero to decarbonization. And we're going to create some trillion dollar companies in the next few years that help us get to net zero, that help us decarbonize. In construction, which is one of the biggest emitters of CO2, we're starting to see really interesting approaches involving AI helping design new materials, you know, carbon negative materials. If you combine molecules in a certain context, you can simulate what will happen. We're able to analyze how to create um, energy efficiency in real time by measuring usage of buildings, by predicting climate in a week, in a month. Um, and so the physical environment becomes you know, a data processing opportunity and a materials science opportunity. So machine learning, the ability to simulate, the ability to capture and act on data at scale all becomes essentially part of the normal expectations if you are in a construction company, a development company. And once you have visibility on all sorts of data, such as um, energy use, building use, water use, you can make decisions that have an impact both in cost saving, but in you know, helping save the planet. Sure. Next question on the list is Mari Hetherington. Um, do you see, how do you see AI working uh, beneficially in the healthcare sector, especially in the care of the el elderly? These are really good questions. So if you think at the moment about the greatest and most important data source in our lives that we're not really making the most of, it's our bodies. You know, we might go once a year for a checkup. We might occasionally take our blood pressure. Some of us who are not diabetic are wearing continuous glucose monitors just to see how we react to certain foods and track that because there are now apps that make it easy to do that. But we've barely started. And it makes no sense that in 2023, people are having strokes and heart attacks that could have been predicted, but we haven't been collecting those sources of data. It makes no sense that we are not aware of you know, dehydration that changes our performance or our sleep patterns that could optimize our productivity or which particular foods will make us long-term avoid illness based on our own genetic um, makeup. So I am quite optimistic. I'm, I'm running a health tech community and there are some people doing awesome things in using AI and other technologies to design medicines, to track us and our performance using little patches that we wear on our skin that can send micro needles through the subcutaneous level to measure what's happening in the bloodstream. That can, there's, there's a company I'm involved with called Spirocheck um, that spun out of Imperial College that allows you to breathe into a tube and it uses effective algorithms um, to work out if there's any indication that you have a difficult to treat cancer before there are symptoms, because the biomarkers emitted by the cancer can be um, spotted um, by gas chromatography, and then the algorithm can say, actually, you need wow. a scan. So there's amazing science meets creative thinking meets startup financing and we just need regulators to open the door to make it possible that these companies survive but um i can see because of um the lack of work we've done on tracking the bodies over the next decade or so we're going to get so much smarter at it that it will give us a chance to extend life you know to a noticeable degree once yeah. you can understand genomics and bioinformatics and avoiding, you know, completely unnecessary ways that people get blood poisoning or collapse. Um, you know, we have the tools, they're cheap. 
we have a question here from Nathan Hesketh, which I think was a long question. And then he said, I've used GPT to shorten my question. So it does Microsoft's mission, dominance in LLMs and acquisition of AAA gaming studios hint at potentially problematic business ethics in handling powerful IPs? No. Capitalism wants to question the, the second time round, to be honest. <laughs> Capitalism is, you know, slightly complicated, but it does tend towards monopoly building. And, <clears throat> you know, it's completely enlightened self-interest for a big tech company like Microsoft to try and dominate, because the more you control, the more you can set prices. And it's the role of enlightened government to counter monopolies by making sure that there's fair access to markets. And one of the big risks in the short term that I see with generative AI is it costs an awful lot of money to create the training data to build a large language model. So if there are two or three big companies that can afford that and they get to set the rules, what happens to the rest of us? Because once there is limited con consumer choice, bad stuff tends to happen. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, the big companies are necessarily heading towards being evil, but they're certainly heading towards being less accountable, um, choosing what they give back to society, whether it's playing games with tax so they pay as little as possible, whether it's deciding they're not going to moderate toxic conversations because you know, they don't really have to, they'll pay the fines when needed. Um, let's shout now for greater regulatory accountability. Well, that Laura Turner's question with seven votes here, due to the rapid evolution of AI, is it possible to create that suitably robust regulatory fr framework to keep up with it? Is that possible, do you think? If we're quick and if we get involved by expressing our concerns, I really don't like that the people dominating the conversation here are a few AI pioneers because it skews the debate and the rest of us need to express our hopes but also our fears. And the trouble is when people are talking a foreign language and a lot of the detail of um, machine learning is, you know, takes a certain complexity to understand. They start building a culture that becomes unreachable by the rest of us. We need high quality regulators who have powers of enforcement, but especially powers to convene and to have the bigger conversation and to do it now, because we can't wait because of that doubling and doubling. There was a, a piece written last month by the author of Sapiens, uh, A Brief History of Humankind, but Yuval Harari, as I'm sure you, you know, you spoke about democracy and how AI could hijack free speech, yep. um, open, honest conversation between people, hey, that is democracy. You know, if that then gets hijacked, then the, the trust in our institutions, what's left of it, frankly, after the last what, 15, 20 years, um, you know, could dismantle and plunge us into some kind of societal Armageddon. How do you react to that? Do you think that's possible? And the backdrop being, you've got a lot of middle class people that will lose their status, identity and jobs. And we all know that revolutions have historically, almost all of them have been kicked off by mi middle classes getting pissed off with a mob beneath them also kind of disenfranchised. So without being too negative, what are your, your reactions to that possibility? It's happening now. I mean, the great Russian project at the moment, and they've been pretty effective at it, is to sow distrust of leaders in countries around the world, to try and divide societies, to create uncertainty, but especially mistrust. And they've done that by using bot armies, by promoting fake narratives and it's had an effect whether it's on the Brexit vote, on US politics, 
on what's happening in elections elsewhere. What happens when you can weaponize this at scale, when you can customize propaganda based on a detailed understanding of what each recipient's prejudices are and what's gonna get them agitated? And you can create a mistrust that leads to extremism, that leads to intolerance, that leads to problems. But it's not just state actors. You know, the criminals are doing amazing creative work, creating deep fakes that they then send to family members to say, hey, I've been kidnapped. You need to wire money to this account, otherwise they're gonna kill me. And there have been you know, examples of phone calls and video messages that seem compelling. So we're just at the beginning. What's the big hope, David? The most positive, uplifting thing to end this webinar on? Many of us have not gained immense satisfaction from the work we've done over the last decades. We're increasingly reflecting. Lockdowns have helped that. We're starting, especially younger people, to question what we want from our work. The AI, when used wisely, can push us towards the higher bits of the Maslow's pyramid, towards that self-actualization. We just need to make sure more and more of us have a path up that pyramid and are not left behind. And that can also, at the same time, provide at pretty much zero cost access to the best educators in the world, access to signals that our body is going to be in trouble if we don't change behavior because we're monitoring and measuring. And I guess my big hope is we'll stop being depressed about the planet overheating and what climate change will mean in practice, because the AI will help us decarbonize in smart ways with you know, everything from data measurement in real time to creating new materials to helping minimize energy use. So I'm an optimist, well, otherwise I wouldn't be in tech, but I do think it's time to ask some questions. Quite. Fantastic. Thank you very much, David. What a great way to end the, uh, the webinar. Um, really appreciate your insight. There'll be lots of questions. The link will be live for a month. Um, so there'll be 1,500 people uh, plus actually registered for this. So we know that we get an audience um, after the actual live audience. So thank you, David, for your part in generating such a huge audience today. That's really, really appreciated. And I love the fact that you ended also on the, on the climate piece, obviously, which is kind of absolutely key for us all right otherwise we won't be around but also the piece around seeking meaningful work which is very much what Randstad is about of course so have a great Thursday everyone thank you David we'll be in touch again no doubt uh, have a great day cheers bye bye